Welcome back everyone. This is part two of my presentation. Um, uh, for those of you who saw part one, and um, my name's uh, Michael Regan, Mike Regan, people call me, and um, I'm the Professor of Human Factors for the Research Centre for Integrated Transport Innovation at the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of New South Wales uh, here in Sydney, Australia. And um, if you um, look at the first part of my presentation, you'll find out a bit more about me and what I've done and uh, what I know about um, distraction and have done in the areas of distraction and inattention. So in part one, I covered um, a number of issues, as you can see, um, the definition and mechanisms around distraction. Uh, I talked about the effects of driver distraction on driving performance. Uh, I talked about driver distraction and uh, crashes. And I talked about driver distraction and what we know about different um, uh, driver engagements with different sources of distraction and uh, to what extent those sources of distraction and types of engagements increase crash risk. Um, and then I came to a conclusion. In the second part of this um, talk, what I'd like to do is to um, talk about uh, briefly, some driver distraction prevention and management strategies that uh, tend to be um, used particularly by road authorities as tools for, for managing distraction. Um, and then I'd like to talk about some evidence-based countermeasures, in other words, some countermeasures to distraction um, that uh, we know from recent research um, are most likely to be effective in um, preventing and mitigating the effects of distraction. So the second talk's really about, um, not so much about what is distraction and what are its effects. This is about what do you do about them. So that's what the second part of this uh, talk is about. Um, and again, I'd just like to mention, as I mentioned in the first part of the uh, talk, uh, that uh, the second part derives from a couple of um, book chapters that uh, I've just written with a colleague um, in, in uh, Cars Q in Queensland here in Australia, uh, Dr. Uh, Oscar, Oscar Oviedo uh, Trispolakios, uh, and I referenced those two um, book chapters in part one of the presentation, and I think I might have referenced them in this part as well. We'll see. So what I wanted to um, uh, mention here, um, and it's only one slide, is that there are many different prevention and management strategies that we have available to us uh, to manage distraction. And in the um, book chapter that we just, uh, that Oscar and I just wrote, um, that's in press, and also in the first book that I wrote on driver distraction that I mentioned in part one uh, of this talk, uh, we talked about these different um, prevention and management strategies. And uh, I won't go into them, but uh, suffice to say uh, that uh, book chapter um, goes, goes through those and um, provides for each of these uh, different um, dot points here. Some of the things that um, particularly road and transport authorities could be doing and are doing at the moment uh, to manage distraction. But now I want to talk about what work has been done uh, to try to determine experimentally um, through uh, scientific evaluation the things that are likely to work and have been found to work. I wanted to start off by saying that there have been many countermeasures uh, that have been developed um, in an attempt to prevent and mitigate distracted driving. Um, and uh, that second book chapter that I talked about a moment ago um, talks about the things, the sorts of things that people have been doing. But unfortunately, very few of the things that have been done in the distraction space have been evaluated to actually establish their effectiveness in um, enhancing driver performance and in particular, um, in enhancing safety. Um, and countermeasures are supported by empirical research um, uh, I'm going to talk about in this part of the talk, and, and they're going to focus on those which um, have been found to reduce the occurrence or impact of distracted driving. So I can't emphasize how important it is when deploying countermeasures to distraction um, and any other countermeasure in road safety um, 
the importance of evaluation. We need to evaluate the things we deploy. And, and what we need to do is we need to set up um, the studies. Uh, when we deploy countermeasure, we need to set, set up the deployment process in a way that allows us to be able to evaluate the effectiveness of that countermeasure or all those countermeasures. That's very important. Um, in the book chapter, that, and uh, there, here's the reference to the book chapter I was telling you about, um, um, what we did was uh, uh, look at these the research that had been done and the evidence uh, base in relation to countermeasures that um, seem to seem to have worked in the distraction space, and we organised them um, within uh, I think it's Rasmussen's uh, hierarchy hierarchy of controls for the management of risk. So any of you who work in the in the safety space uh, will know about this hierarchy of controls for managing risk. And so the most effective controls are the ones that focus on elimination of the risk at the top of the hierarchy, as you can see there. Um, and um, the ones that are probably least effective in uh, managing risk are the ones that fall into the personal protective equipment uh, category, which you'll see at the bottom of the, um, of the hierarchy there. So in each of the slides, I'm going to position each of the countermeasures that we've um, discovered uh, can have some effect um, or have had an effect um, within each of those, these um, uh, levels of control. So in terms of elimination, um, probably the standout, uh, the standout feature, even though this is probably the only uh, countermeasure that hasn't actually been evaluated, but from first principles, I think we can say it's most likely to um, uh, eliminate distraction is fully automated vehicles. Um, and fully automated, fully automated vehicles, as categorised by the Society of Automotive Engineers at um, what they call levels four or five, or four and five, uh, don't require a, a human operator at all to control or monitor the vehicle. So these are vehicles like robo taxis where you can hop in, there's, there's no steering wheel, you don't have to control the vehicle, the vehicle drives itself. And so it is anticipated that as um, the driver won't have any responsibility to uh, control or monitor such vehicles at this level of automation, that the distraction won't play a role um, at all, probably, um, we think at this stage. Uh, the problem is that the projected benefits of these vehicles uh, might only be observed in 25 uh, to 30 years. Um, and the other thing is that uh, we're not quite sure, even though uh, occupants in these vehicles um, are not required to drive the vehicles, whether there might be any other activities that they might be required to perform, perform of a non-driving nature that they might be distracted from. So it might be driver distraction, but there might be some other form of distraction that might go on depending on how uh, the human, inter human machine interface within these vehicles is implemented. So. So I think it's a matter of watching this space, but certainly from a driver distraction perspective, I'd say that uh, fully automated vehicles should eliminate uh, certainly at least driver distraction. Uh, workload managers are another um, uh, category of um, distraction prevention. Um, and they're a, a form of technology that are already built into some vehicles and they fall into the substitution level of control in uh, the uh, hierarchy of risk management I talked about a moment ago. And these are driver support systems that prevent driving and non-driving related information to drivers in a way that doesn't distract them. Um, and so, for example, there are technologies in some vehicles at the moment, uh, some workload managers, um, uh, that people you know, might not even realise are in the vehicles that will delay an incoming call, for example, until after a person has driven through a high workload intersection, because we know from what I said in part one of my uh, lectures that um, if driving demand is high, um, then it's more likely that um, a distraction could have a more detrimental effect on driving performance, um, unless they, the driver self-regulates and says, well, driving demand's high and I'm, I'm not gonna allow myself to be distracted. So these workload managers basically can uh, use a range of sensors to sense the driving demand at any situation uh, that the driver's under in the vehicle. 
So if they're driving, so the sensors in the vehicle will know they might be driving through an intersection at night in the rain um, and uh, turning a, a sharp, doing a right hand turn. This is a high workload situation. So they might delay the, the uh, presentation of information, say through a mobile phone and take a, um, a phone call instead. Uh, and they might advise the uh, driver not to engage in a driving, in a distracting um, activity um, during that period. Or uh, some of the clever systems might uh, present information, not through a visual display, but, but um, change the display modality. So the workload manager might decide that it's safer to present the information to the driver uh, through, through the ears or through the, the, um, through the, uh, the radio. Um, if um, if uh, they're in a high workload situation. So we know that these technologies can reduce distraction that derives from uh, some driver assistance systems of the kind I talked about in part one of um, my um, presentation. But at this stage, we don't know how, how, how effective they are in managing non-driving related information, for example, that might come from uh, some uh, infotainment systems that are in vehicles. But um, they're very important systems that we need to uh, monitor and further evaluate. Um, road design is another countermeasure to distraction. It's um, an engineering control. Um, and road, good road design is important um, because it can um, uh, have a number of effects. Um, if the road is designed in a way to cushion the driver when they have a crash, um, uh, to protect them uh, through the use of wire rope barriers and that sort of thing, then that will have an effect in mitigating the effects of someone who's lost control of the vehicle um, due to distraction. If there are things like uh, rumble strips on the road, um, they will remind the driver, uh, if they're visually distracted, that they're, that they're driving off the road. Or if there are rough shoulders, that will have the same effect. Uh, things like speed humps will slow the vehicle down. So if the driver is distracted and, and you can use engineering design you know, through the road to slow people down, then the consequences of a distraction-related crash um, will, be, uh, will be less. So, um, and variable speed signs can also be used um, to remind people um, to slow down or to remind them that uh, you know, texting is dangerous and, and uh, other road safety messages. So the design of the road and the road infrastructure is another um, important engineering control that has been found to be effective in, um, in uh, especially mitigating the, uh, the effects of distraction. Um, there are many advanced driver assistance systems um, that are available in um, uh, current uh, production vehicles. Uh, many that you'd be familiar with, things like cruise control and lane centering um, and um, uh, autonomous emergency braking or forward collision warning as it's sometimes called. And, and the, these kinds of systems are very important because they can prevent and mitigate the impact of um, distraction-related crashes. I mentioned in part one of my talk, uh, for example, that um, the two major kinds of uh, crashes that occur due to uh, cognitive and visual distraction um, are single vehicle runoff road crashes um, and, um, and rear end crashes. And so if you've got a system like cruise control that can uh, regulate your uh, following distances and uh, keep a, a long headway distance. Um, if you've got lane centering technologies like lane keeping assist that can prevent you from um, running off the road when you're visually distracted, because that's what visual distraction normally does do, um, then um, then these systems provide warnings and can even actually prevent the vehicle from um, crashing into the vehicle in front if there's forward collision warning or autonomous emergency braking or, or preventing the distracted driver from hitting a pedestrian, for example. Um, the, the, the flip side, though, is that poorly designed um, human machine interfaces in these systems uh, can actually distract drivers. And so there's some evidence of that. So while these systems are designed to make drivers more safe and can actually um, can uh, prevent mitigate the effects of uh, distraction. Um, the flip side is that they themselves can be distracting if the warnings they issue or the alarms uh, uh, distract people by startling them or by requiring them to uh, 
uh, listen to them unnecessarily at times when they might not need to be uh, issuing warnings and so on. So there's been quite a bit of work around this area. But these systems, are, I'd say, along with um, the road, road design are very important. Uh, blocking technology is another category of um, distraction countermeasure that's been found to be um, effective. It includes mobile phone applications and hardware, which um, are aimed at uh, blocking mobile phone use while driving. Um, and certainly the technology has been effective in reducing mobile phone use while driving. And uh, my colleague up in Queensland, um, Dr. Oscar Oviedo or Tespalakios has done some research in this area. Uh, but some of the research he and others have done has, has found that even though, though these technologies, you know, are effective in reducing mobile phone use uh, while driving, um, acceptance of them is low among drivers and particularly younger drivers. So there's always this human factor uh, that we have to contend with when we um, when we come up with um, these technologies and uh, and how we can enhance acceptance of these sorts of technologies that we know are effective. Feedback systems are another um, category of countermeasure. There's been quite a bit of research on these systems, and basically, these are systems that um, give um, drivers real time. Uh, can give them real-time feedback on their driving behaviour. So, for example, uh, the systems that can um, monitor to how long a driver has been looking away from the uh, roadway, for example, and give them an alert or a or a or a warning or a uh, or a message to say you you know you just glanced away from the roadway for more than uh, two seconds, for example, or or you're you know you're glancing. Um, too frequently away from the forward roadway and you know this is increasing um, you know your uh, risk of a crash and those sorts of systems have been found to be actually very effective the real-time systems in helping to calibrate people when they look away from the roadway you know for example if they're looking at a mobile phone or something inside the vehicle to make them more aware of the fact that they need to adopt shorter uh, glances when they're looking away from the forward roadway um, and there are even some uh, feedback systems that um, consider um, sort of uh, parental norms and um, systems that have been developed um, where, um, um, you know, the person sort of given feedback, not during the drive, but, but after the drive about their performance. And, um, um, and it involves sort of bringing in parents as well. Um, to um, you know, get the parents in, involved in the process of, of giving them this feedback um, or providing them with feedback. So, so these feedback systems are very important and feedback generally is, is effective um, in changing human behaviour. Um, legislation is probably the countermeasure that most of us would be familiar with. Um, uh, here in Australia, uh, currently, um, there's a ban on, on the use of uh, handheld phones unless um, they're driver's aids. But in part one of my presentation, I did make the point that um, even though they might be, uh, driver's aids might be legal, um, you know, if you're using you know, Google Maps or something like that, uh, generally people are still touching the phone while they're driving, they're looking at the phone. Um, and you can't say that that's not distracting, uh, although we can say that that's less distracting than uh, in the old days when we used paper maps to uh, navigate, um, which was in incredibly distracting. And uh, we know from uh, what I said in part one of my talk that uh, reading and writing, um, which include could include reading a, a paper map, uh, incre increases crash risk, I think it was by about uh, six or seven times. So, so these driver's aids, you know, they're still distracting. You can't say they're not distract, distracting and they're legal, but, but they need to be used, um, you know, uh, carefully and uh, responsibly. Um, but getting back to legislation generally, um, there is this legislation. Um, I'm not aware actually that the legislation has actually been evaluated by anyone here in Australia. I'm not sure what the case is in New Zealand. I know in America, um, um, legislation banning the use of um, mobile phones has been evaluated. Um, in, there have been some studies, but the reports are mixed about the effectiveness of the bans across jurisdictions. 
um, uh, generally uh, it's found that um, the bands are effective for a short period of time, maybe around six months or so, um, but only if there's uh, solid police enforcement of the bands. Um, if there's not, then what you find is that uh, the effect of the band sort of tapers off and you're almost back to where you started. So they can be effective to a certain extent, or legislation can be, but it depends on how it's framed and how it's enforced. And um, it's interesting to note that here in Australia, we're going through a process, uh, the National Transport Commission is going through a process of revising our legislation uh, to make it less focused on, on uh, technology and to produce what they call a technology neutral uh, road rules. And so if you go to the internet and look up technology internet neutral road rules and National Transport Commission, uh, you'll learn more about what that's about. And I've been involved as a um, one of a number of um, ex distraction experts in helping them to, to work their way through the development of that legislation. Um, police enforcement is an administrative control. Um, police operations to increase compliance of legislation, banning different forms of mobile use while driving um, uh, have been around for a while. And as I said, they vary in their intensity. Uh, one, of the, one of the problem, and, and, and of course can be effective, police enforcement is very effective um, if there are good rules and, and lots of targeted strategic enforcement. We know that from other areas of road safety. In the destruction space, um, the problem is that police officers are unable um, often to correctly enforce legislation in many circumstances due, due to a lack of resources um, and poor visibility inside the vehicle and being able to actually see what people are doing inside the vehicle and know for sure that they're distracted. And um, automated police enforcement is, is one of the big ticket items at the moment. And um, um, I know here in uh, New South Wales, um, we have a trial running at the moment uh, being run by the um, Transport for New South Wales Centre for Road Safety, in which there are uh, traffic safety cameras that are um, being um, uh, set up around the state, uh, particularly around the metropolitan area, um, which, which can, act, can actually detect uh, through um, photographing vehicles that are approaching the camera, um, whether they're holding a mobile phone, for example, and uh, whether it might be even sitting in their lap. So whether they're using it, in fact, and they're apparently very reliable from what I've heard. Um, I'm not sure whether any form of evaluation has been done um, yet to um, determine just how effective they are. But, um, but uh, this is one way, um, once they're you know, out there in large numbers um, through automated enforcement um, to um, you know, re re prevent people from uh, using these phones um, within vehicles, using phones within vehicles. Um, this slide probably is one that might be of particular interest uh, to you because I know Caroline was saying that uh, BREAK as an organisation um, has a lot to do with uh, fleet safety and fleet management, um, road safety management. And, um, you know, driving for work procedures and policies are a form of administrative control um, um, and implementation of, you know, workplace health and safety organisational procedures and policies to reduce distracted driving and enhance safety of drivers um, has been uh, found to be effective. Um, so for example, truck and bus drivers working uh, for organisations that enforce texting bans have lower texting and driving prevalence in comparison to companies uh, without the bans. And so there's no doubt that, uh, you know, companies that employ people who drive vehicles um, um, Unlike, um, you know, um, for others who are driving uh, vehicles for non-work purposes generally and, and only, um, you know, have to abide by laws that are enforced by police in the community, um, you know, employers have much more power through, uh, through different kinds of sanctions to be able to prevent people from engaging in activities that are particularly unsafe. And I was involved in developing a, a document um, which is this document uh, called Developing an Effective Policy for Mobile Phone Use in Vehicles. Um, it was developed by the National Road Safety 
partnership program here in Australia about uh, three years ago. Um, uh, the main role I played was to help them um, determine how to, how to structure the document and, and the sort of contents that should be in it, uh, as well as some uh, a bit of research in the beginning on the state of the distraction problem. And I'd regard this as probably the best document I've seen anywhere. It's quite unique uh, because what's great about it is that it's it's titled Developing an Effective Policy for Mobile Phone Use in Vehicles, and it's targeted at uh, fleet at, at companies that operate um, fleets of vehicles. But really, it's about an effective policy for reducing distraction um, when people are driving for work purposes. So I'd strongly encourage you to. Um, download that from the internet. Um, it's very holistic um, and uh, covers a whole range of different things that uh, employees can be can be doing to reduce distraction. And, um, and don't think of it as just about mobile phone use, think about it as how to develop an effective policy for reducing distraction in your companies for, um, in relation to uh, driver distraction. Um, Educational programs, of course, uh, there are many of them around. Um, most of them, unfortunately, aren't properly evaluated or evaluated at all. And uh, in the book chapter that um, Oscar and I wrote, um, we cited um, in, in both book chapters that are in press, uh, we cited uh, uh, examples of three um, educational programs that you should be able to find on the internet um, that have been evaluated. Um, and uh, were shown to um, uh, be able to reduce mobile phone use while driving and were certain, uh, effective to a certain extent at least, um, one or two more than others. So um, you can uh, look those up yourselves and um, you'll get a copy of these slides. Um, in terms of training, um, this is quite an interesting area. I've done quite a bit of research in um, training uh, perceptual and cognitive skills uh, during my career. Um, and, and this focal, um, focal training program was quite an interesting one. Um, and it consists of uh, sort of three stages, pre-test training and post-test. And, and basically drivers who received the focal training engaged in fewer in-vehicle glances that were longer than two seconds by roughly 25 percentage points when compared to a, a placebo group or a control group that didn't get the training. So there's definitely um, evidence out there that training um, is effective in changing people's glance behaviours um, when they're engaged in the distracting activities. So we need to, uh, to we need to be uh, looking at those sorts of programs as we go forward. Um, in terms of, and this is the last slide, in terms of the final category uh, of the uh, hierarchy of uh, control, which is called personal protective equipment, if we relate this, um, you know, back to distraction, um, uh, we can say certainly that you know people who are distracted if they've got seat belts, if the vehicle's designed to protect them, um, if there's good emergency care after they've had the crash, um, they probably should have included road, road road design could be included here, but that's really an engineering control. Um, then they're more likely, they're less likely to be um, seriously or, or fatally injured. Uh, in a in a distraction related crash, um, and certainly there's research to show that these um, you know protective um, mechanisms, if if you want to call them that, reduce the severity of uh, crashes and um, reduce the number of fatal crashes. Um, so that's all I wanted to say about those measures. I, I just wanted to leave you all with a taste for the future of distraction. I, I did um, mention during this. Um, this lecture uh, during uh, the beginning of part two of the lecture that um, in the future when vehicles are fully automated um, that it's likely there will be no distraction but, but I want to talk now just for a couple of minutes and I'll be finished in a couple of minutes just about the intervening period. Um, distraction is likely to continue to be a road safety problem. Um, I certainly think as vehicles become increasingly automated and there is some evidence for this. Um, for partially automated vehicles, there's currently no evidence that uh, these vehicles reduce distraction. So um, if, you've got, uh, if you've got these vehicles that are partially automated and can drive on highways um, sort of by themselves at the moment, there's no evidence that 
they actually reduce distraction. On the contrary, uh, what we find is that um, partial automation has been shown to create distraction due to drivers becoming uh, decreasingly engaged in the driving task. And this new book that I just published um, uh, with uh, colleagues, which I showed you a picture of in part one, um, uh, has a chapter which I co-wrote on precisely this issue, the future of distraction. Um, so there was a study in China with Tesla drivers, for example, uh, recently that found that drivers often engaged in distracting activities while they were using the autopilot system in the Tesla. And um, we, we know there have been some uh, crashes, a couple of crashes, high profile ones um, in uh, Teslas um, that have involved people who've been uh, engaging in distracting activities while they've had the autopilot system on in the, those vehicles. And not just in Teslas, but in other vehicles as well. We also know that automation actions and alerts that are unexpected can cause what we call automation surprises. And uh, in doing so, distract drivers. So if you're not aware of what the automation is doing in these partially automated vehicles or what you're meant to be doing, um, that can surprise you and the surprise can distract you. And there's also evidence that um, the takeover quality in vehicles that are equipped with automated driving features is impaired when people are distracted. So in so-called um, level uh, three vehicles, which have been developed but not yet deployed commercially, but there's been a lot of experimentation on them, uh, they can basically, for example, drive you, um, uh, you know, all the way from Sydney to Melbourne along a highway and you don't have to do anything. But they might be able to drive you in some urban environments and you don't have to do anything. You've just got to sit back and let the, the car drive. But if the car can't handle the driving conditions, you've got to take back control of the vehicle. And, um, and the, the vehicle issues what we call a takeover request. And, and we know from research that people were distracted are not good at taking back control. Um, and the time it takes them uh, to take back control is increased dramatically. And the time to recover control, once they take back control, uh, takes much longer than if they're not distracted. So, so that's an issue in these sort of semi-automated vehicles. Something else I talked about in, in that book chapter um, is that drivers in future might be distracted um, by the behaviour of vehicles that are operating autonomously. If the autonomous vehicles have been programmed to drive in ways that violate their expectations. And so this is a big area of research too at the moment. Um, just in the same way that a driver drives erratically through a traffic stream that you're driving in and that attracts your attention, if uh, automated vehicles uh, drive in ways that violate our expectations as drivers, we might find them distracting and, and the vehicles themselves become a source of distraction. So, so th these are just a, a handful of issues. I talk more about this issue in that, in that book chapter and in some other uh, papers I've re written recently on this topic. And, and basically for vehicles with high levels of automation, um, countermeasure, countermeasure development's gonna, gonna need to focus in future on a, on a somewhat um, different set of distraction related topics and issues. And that's really the key point I wanted to make. So in conclusion, um, I just wanted to um, say that driver distraction is just one mechanism of driver distraction, of driver inattention. As I said in concluding the uh, first part of my, my uh, presentation, uh, there is uh, evidence that uh, distraction degrades driving performance and safety. As I said, in some situations, distraction uh, can actually seems to be able to improve safety, although in a limited um, set of uh, circumstances and we need to understand a little more about how distraction it could actually increase driver arousal and vigilance. Um, there's not been much research done on that topic. Um, automated vehicles, as I said in part two of the talk, will create new distraction issues that need to be characterised and understood. And I think finally and, and very importantly, and this was underscored in a, um, an excellent report um, produced by the European Union on distraction in 2018. Um, countermeasures to distraction uh, really must be derived from the best available and, and reliable scientific knowledge of the underlying mechanisms of distraction. And I've talked about what those mechanisms 
are today. And not many people really understand them, even though I've published a lot on that topic. Um, and and countermeasures need to be uh, based on the prevalence of different distracting activities and the risks associated with these activities. And that's where naturalistic diving studies are so important because as we saw in part one of the talk, um, they provide us with information about how prevalent um, uh, distraction involvement is when drivers are engaged in activities. And also the odds ratios give us a, uh, a sense for the, um, the size of the increase in risk associated with engaging and distracting activities. Um, so that's all I wanted to say. I'm, I'm grateful to have been given the opportunity to, to, give, to give two presentations um, uh, today. I'm sorry uh, uh, that I couldn't actually give both of the presentations live because unfortunately, um, uh, when I would have had to speak live, I'll be teaching next week. So um, I'd like to thank Caroline for arranging this special um, uh, special uh, session for me to give uh, parts one and parts two of my presentation. And thank you very much. Um, if you need to contact me um, back in Australia, uh, this is how you can contact me. Uh, that's my email address, and uh, I've even got my mobile phone number here if anyone needs to, um, to, to chat to me. So thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. That's uh, the end of my presentation.